welcome to our new program, 401k Real Chat. This is Fred Barstein, contributing editor for wealthmanagement.com's RPA Edge and CEO at Trow, TPSU, and 401k TV. I invite the most interesting, innovative, and impactful retirement and wealth management professionals that I know, asking them to provide open, honest, and candid answers to three important and at times difficult questions. So let's get real. So this week we host UCLA professor Shlomo Bernardsi, author of Save More Tomorrow and the father of Auto Features, asking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of Auto Features. So welcome, Shlomo. Thank you, Flynn. So let's start with the good. Um, Auto features have had a huge impact on increasing participation, savings rates, and DC plans. What made you think that the DC market would benefit so much from the application of behavioral finance? And did the results meet your expectations? So, to be honest, Fred, I thought it would make a difference, but I was actually surprised how big of a difference kind of the auto everything has has made on, on DC plans. Always had the, the intuition uh, that kind of make it easy would be very powerful. You use inertia in a sense to help people save, save more, save smarter when everything is on an autopilot. And if you look at the results, they've They've actually surprised me. Um, participation rates, when you automatically enroll people, are in the 90 plus percent. 90 plus percent. And one of the things that I think people don't fully recognize when you think about diversity and equity, if you get participation rates almost to 100 percent, you don't have a lot of societal gaps. Everyone got to save to make it happen. So societal gaps tend to close and they'll work on it. That whether you think about income level, gender, um, <clears throat> minorities, when you apply those autopilots to 401k plans, societal gaps either close completely or at least it dramatically gets smaller. Now, Having said that, if we were to combine automatic enrollment with what I call future enrollment, so the people who opt out, at that point, they're engaged, they're coming to opt out. We ask them if they would like to start saving next year, mm. we would probably get 98% participation. Mm. Fast forward, saving weights. <clears throat> The Save More to More program that I designed with Nobel laureate Richard Taylor <clears throat> has dramatically boosted saving rates, dramatically. We, um, last time I calculated uh, the number of people who have benefited from kind of a saving escalator feature whether it is exactly the original program or all the variants that we've seen out there, there were 15 to 16 million people in the U.S. alone. Wow. For me. My best uh, back-of-the-envelope calculations lately are 25 million people in the U.S. alone. But again, having said that, we used to automatically enroll, people think at 3%, but you know they're not as bold as me. If you go back enough years, if you've been in that business for a few decades, we used to automatically enroll at 2%. Mm. Then we switched to 3 Then the research suggested you could go up to 6 But the research I've been doing with Boya actually suggests that the starting point could easily be 7%. So we could fine tune the ingredients to really improve things. And while I don't want to spend too much time on investing today, 
I believe that QDIAs have made a huge difference. We're no longer seeing people so heavily concentrated in company stock. We don't see so many people 100% in cash while inflation is high and going to eat their account for sure. So I think whether you think about um, <clears throat> the number of people who are saving, especially low-income minorities, saving rates and diversification, there has been kind of making it easy to do the right things made a huge difference. So looking back, what would you have done differently uh, with everything that you've learned since you started the program with uh, Professor Thaler? I don't think a lot uh, that I would have done differently. I think there's some fine tuning of ingredients, like the Voya research <laughs> that I've done would suggest, maybe automatically enroll at 7%. <coughs> maybe automatically enroll at 7%, automatically escalate at 2%, and, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe think about uh, escalating every six months. Nobody said it should be every year. Might be easier 1% every six months than two every year. And we're doing some research on that uh, with Boya. But I think it's not so much what I would have done differently as much as I'd like to focus on what could be done going forward? Because I, I think there's so much that could be done in a world where you get more data and where you have the digital capabilities to personalize the journey for people. So if you think about an autopilot, a double-decker Airbus has a different autopilot formula than a smaller commuter plane. And the case also with individuals. So let me share with you one of the things I'm most excited about uh, today, which is my vision for Save More to More 2.0. We've placed so much effort on kind of managed investing, or as we call it, managed account. But I think we haven't put enough effort to think about managed savings. We're kind of telling everyone you should have the same autopilot. But I'd like to start calling for dramatic differences across people that perhaps would suggest that you should save less. So let me actually, uh, this is a simplified version, but the concept I've been lucky enough to work with Athena Advisory and Brian Cosmono on which is, think about the world as we might have incentive to save, we either have a match or we don't. Sometimes we have a super generous match, like universities often would have two for one and you don't want to leave money on the table. But let's also think about the cost of saving, like having debt. Some people don't have, and some are really struggling. They're actually piling debt, maybe they go for payday lenders, um, and let's think about kind of the diversity of the employee population. So if you have no match, there's no rush to save today. Uh, maybe you save more tomorrow. But <clears throat> what if you have a generous match? Why leave money on the table? Well, yet it might be that there's a generous match. And at the same time, you also have expensive debt. Things are quite expensive. A lot of people are struggling these days. So maybe you don't save more today. Maybe it's the original program, save more to more. But I think what we often miss is, what if there's a very generous match and you don't have debt? Why wait? Save more today and tomorrow. Don't leave money on the table. And the group I'm most concerned about and it's the group that doesn't have a match and yet is struggling and piling debt. And maybe they should save less today and more tomorrow. Right. So my thinking is, in a world in which we get more data, why can't this autopilot be smarter? Right. Why can't we actually fit the right manage saving solution to the right people. Right. So 
we can avoid situation in which we might have an individual who is piling debt. We make them save more. And at the same time, they're just piling more debt. We yeah. have, yeah, sorry. have to first find, do those cases happen? And for that, we need data. Then we have to find out how do we change the autopilot to fill to fit those groups who really struggle, really need a solution. The it's it's sort of as you were going through it, I was thinking about the Abbott Labs and the student loan debt, where they recognized that problem and said, "We want these people to get the match, but they can't say we're going to give it to them anyway." So it was brilliant, and it's now being codified as Secure 2.0 passes. So. That's great. Well, let's let's move on to our second. If, yeah. if I may, and, and sorry for interrupting sure, you, sure. I think all the work that's been done uh, on student debt is <laughs> is critical. But but let me also share with you that people are so bad managing their debt. Right, it goes way beyond uh, student loans. Think about yeah. Yeah. mortgages and refinancing, it's often 5 to 10% of pay that lower income people leave on the table because they're not as sophisticated refinancing. So I think we have to start thinking more holistically how to raise financially. Okay, well, let's go to the bad of auto features. And while auto features have had a dramatic impact on the accumulation of assets, you've been very vocal that the same application may not be as effective in the decumulation phase. Could you explain why not? And how do we get participants to engage, which, as you know, has been a big challenge? So one of the challenges is that people obviously accumulate assets over their lifetime, but the challenge is that we forget that they also accumulate differences. And as people accumulate differences, it's hard to have that one shoe mm. fit everyone. So if you think about the UPS drivers who, who are being hired every year to deliver Amazon packages, etc. They make the same amount of money. They're young. They're healthy. <clears throat> they look alike. So the auto everything for the accumulation is a good starting point. We should think how to further personalize it, as we discussed about Save More to More 2.0, but it's not a bit starting point. Fast forward. One UPS driver has four kids, three grandkids, still working at 62, like David Marcus in my neighborhood. Another UPS driver might have never had kids, maybe he's not married, maybe he's uh, obese, maybe his hips and back are hurting after carrying boxes. We can't actually give them the same autopilot. And I'd like to show you first kind of a little exercise I did recently for the Wall Street Journal that shows how small changes in preferences need circumstances could create dramatically plans for your um, retirement. So imagine David and Linda. Even though they're of the same age, the same health, and the same account balance, we're going to see how their paychecks could be dramatically different. First of all, and this would be a surprise for some people, uh, Linda is going to have a smaller paycheck because women live longer. So we have to plan for a longer runway. <laughs> Next, well, they're going to pick a different retirement age. And all of these are feasible. I haven't picked unusual preferences. David would like to work till he's 70. Linda is tired of actually teaching over Zoom. She's a school teacher. She'll retire at 62. David is willing to take a bit more risk um, and spend more. And Linda wants to be more conservative so that she's guaranteed to never run out of money. She has to spend a bit less. 
David doesn't uh, want to leave money for his kids. They're going to Harvard Law School and are going to do well. And Linda has a desire to leave 10% of her wealth. And David wants to spend more early in retirement. He would like to actually take the grandkids to Disneyland where he's still strong and healthy and can fly and stand in the lines. And Linda is a bit cautious. She wants to spend less early in retirement and just see that over time the paycheck goes up. Six times difference in the paycheck with the same balance to begin with. So the lesson I take from it is that personalization is critical, critical for the decumulation. So, of course, then the concern everyone would raise, which you hinted to, is how are you going to engage people? And if we don't know about them, then how can you personalize the plan? So I have some good news. While people never engage in the accumulation phase, it just doesn't happen. They have other priorities. It's the easiest thing in the planet in our experience to engage people at the point of retirement. And let me give you a couple of uh, numbers to bring it to life. Uh, 10 plan sponsors that I've worked with where an advisor offered to sit with participants and discuss their income plan. 98.5% of participants who were given the opportunity, retirement age population, have decided to meet. There's no problem to engage. Let me give you one more number. This one I think is more shocking. This was a campaign we did digitally. We didn't optimize the message. It was one shot. We got 10% of participants to actually bother to fill certain questionnaires, engage, because they wanted answers. People are scared to death of running out of money. Unlike accumulation, engagement around retirement is a real pain point. It's timely. You think about David, 384 paychecks from you Uh, PS over his lifetime, he has no clue how to create the next one. He's going to engage if someone can provide them. The, um, it's good news and it's, it's hopeful. And I think you're right. We're, we're seeing as people get closer to retirement, they pay more attention. A young person, as uh, Professor Hirschfeld said, that person 30 years is a stranger and they don't care about that. They care about themselves now. So let's move on to the ugly. You have some very strong opinions on proposed legislation that would incorporate auto features that you think could be very damaging to participants. Uh, Could you explain? So the SAFE Act that has been proposed has great goals and intentions. Make it easy for people to decumulate. 100% in agreement with the intention and the goal. However, the toolkit that is being applied or to everything, I think is applied the wrong way. Why? According to the SAFE Act, it would be okay to automatically enroll people into a decumulation solution, including irreversible solutions. So you could, for example, accidentally take a retiree with stage four cancer, place them in a sphere, and they're never going to leave to enjoy the benefits of that lifetime annuity. So the fix, I think, is, is very easy which is if you want to automatically enroll people into decumulation solutions. And I have to be clear, I have absolutely no problem with that principle, but if you want to do it, 
It has to be the new generation of products that are reversible, that allow people an opportunity right. to be out. And the other thing that I think would be critical, where I think Washington could actually make a difference is not only require that auto decumulation has to be reversible, the flexibility should be kept. It's also critical that we're going to make it easy for people to personalize their decumulation solutions. If you think about accumulation, the equivalent of the SAFE Act would be something like, we're going to automatically enroll you and we'll never ever allow you to either opt out after the first 18 months and if the pandemic hits and you want to lower your saving rates, tough luck, nobody would have ever <coughs> gone for that. So the flexibility being built in the autopilots for accumulation, it has to be built into the decumulation autopilot. So it's not a concern about auto features in general, it's about the way it's we're conceiving it for decumulation with the SAFE Act. Great, thanks. And thank you, uh, as always, uh, for your time. And also, on behalf of the industry, thank you for all the work that you did. Um, you know, we're in a, sometimes we forget, we're in a really important industry. We actually help people and change their lives. And I always say at a TPSU program at the end to the 20 or 30 plant sponsors, if you can help one person in your company to retire more comfortably, to allow them to buy Little League uniforms for their uh, grandchildren, you've made a big difference and, and a big impact on that. And, and people are starting to care. So thank you very much for all the work that you've done. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Fred. And thank you for your weekly five stories, actually. I know it's going to sound like you paid me to say, but it, but it is it is the one thing that I religiously listen to every week. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shlomi. And thank you for watching uh, 401k Real Chat. Please let me know uh, if there are other guests that you would like me to interview. Thank you. Thank you.